The string of attacks coming from the president's Twitter account continue today with a now familiar target, the Mueller investigation, or as Mr. Trump claims, the witch hunt. Amna Nawaz begins our coverage with the latest pushback. I don't think you can prove those numbers one way or the other. There's it's not no the first really time testified. President Trump's advisors have made headlines to attempting to defend his Sunday. version no, of the truth. John Spicer, our press secretary, gave alternative facts to that. So I think it's very important to point out that in a situation like this, you have, over time, facts develop. But the latest comments this Maybe weekend mistake. from the president's Maybe lawyer, Rudy Giuliani, Giuliani continued his team's that. latest strategy to undermine special counsel Robert Mueller's investigation by muddying the waters around Trump's past statements and potential future ones under oath. When you tell me that, you know, he should testify because he's going to tell the truth and he shouldn't worry, well, that's so silly because it's somebody's version of the truth, not the truth. He didn't have a, a conversation about... Truth is about, truth. I, I don't mean to go like... I, no, I it isn't truth. Truth isn't truth. Today, Giuliani took to Twitter to clarify, saying his statement, quote, was not meant as a pontification on moral theology, but instead, he went on, referred to the, quote, classic he said, she said puzzle. The question of the great. president's cooperation Never with the that. Mueller probe remains, but a New York Times report this weekend revealed another member of Trump's team has been working with the special counsel. In at least three interviews totaling more than 30 hours, White House counsel Don McGahn reportedly shared detailed accounts about events at the heart of the Mueller investigation. President Trump responded in a series of tweets today, calling Mueller disgraced and discredited, claiming McGahn met with Mueller's team only with my approval for purposes of transparency, and dismissing the entire investigation as a rigged witch hunt. Mr. Mueller is highly conflicted. Continuing his persistent public attacks of the probe. I say it, I say it again, that whole situation is a rigged witch hunt. But the special counsel's investigation has already yielded a series of indictments, including 13 Russian nationals as conspirators in 2016 election interference. 12 Russian intelligence officers for election-related hacking. It's also led to guilty pleas from former National Security Advisor Michael Flynn, former Deputy Campaign Chair Rick Gates, and former campaign aide George Papadopoulos, who could face up to six months in prison, according to a new sentencing recommendation from Mueller's team. The special counsel's work also led investigators to examine the finances of Michael Cohen, President Trump's former personal lawyer, who multiple reports say could face criminal charges by the end of the month. But it's the bank and tax fraud case against former campaign chair Paul Manafort, whose fate now rests with the jury, that could set the tone for Mueller's work moving forward, and whether or not the president will meet with him at all. For the PBS NewsHour, I'm Amna Nawaz. We take a closer look at the White House counsel's cooperation with the Mueller probe now with Solomon Weisenberg. He was deputy independent counsel during the Whitewater and President Clinton's sexual misconduct investigation. And Catherine Rumler, she was White House counsel for President Obama. And we should note for the record, she currently represents a witness in the special counsel investigation. Welcome back to the program to both of you. Let me start by asking you both to clarify the role of what is the White House counsel's set of responsibilities? Catherine Rumler, to you first, in contrast to a president's personal attorneys. Uh, the White House counsel is there to provide the president with advice, legal advice, sometimes policy advice, sometimes communications advice, um, about really the limits of his authority as president. And so uh, the White House counsel has no role to play um, in advising a president on his particular personal legal issues. That really is a role for his personal lawyer and not for the White House counsel. It's important to remember that the White House counsel is a government official. Um, they are, they're paid by the U.S. government. They're paid by the taxpayer. And their duties and obligations fundamentally are to the Constitution and to um, you know, the office of the presidency and the American people. Saul Weisenberg, would you add or subtract anything from that? Uh, not at all. Couldn't say it any better. The only uh, area in which a White House counsel has some kind of a, other than executive privilege, uh, like any other executive off officer, there's potential executive privilege when you talk about a White House counsel. There's also an intermediary privilege. If a White House counsel is conveying information 
from the president to the president's personal lawyer and vice versa, that and that alone would be privileged. And the case that decided that is N. Ray Lindsay, Bruce Lindsay in the D.C. Circuit back in 98 when our shop was uh, up and running. Saul Weisenberg, staying with you for a moment, how significant is it then, this report, that Don McGahn spent upwards of 30 hours with uh, the Mueller investigative team uh, answering questions in this Russia probe? Well, I think it's very significant. I would have loved to have had 30 hours to question Bruce Lindsay. We had to go to, uh, up to the appellate court to get him to talk to us at all, uh, and that's where that case comes from. But what we don't know is what he is saying. That's just speculation. Uh, I think that uh, something that's being uh, not realized or not commented on enough is that uh, the president's right. He didn't have to let Don McGahn go in. Uh, John Dowd and Ty Cobb didn't have to. Uh, they could have asserted executive privilege. But they said, go on in. And I think the reason they decided to do that is because when they were the lawyers, they saw this as basically a case about um, collusion slash criminal conspiracy involving the Russians and the tr people in the Trump campaign. And they thought Trump had nothing to worry about. Now we see that Bob Mueller apparently has a very broad view of obstruction of justice. And there might be some real second thoughts about whether or not they should have sent McGahn in. Catherine, uh, Catherine Rumler, how do you see this? I mean, do you see it as a decision that was made under one set of circumstances? Uh, now the circumstances have changed? I really don't. Th this is a, a, an issue I disagree with pretty strongly. I think that after the Lindsay case that Mr. Weisenberg referred to, um, and frankly, after the U.S. versus Nixon case, what, um, what the courts have widely recognized is that executive privilege is a qualified privilege, meaning that it gives way um, to, and certainly can give way to, a criminal, duly authorized criminal investigation. And so here, as a practical matter, I don't think that Mr. McGahn had much of a choice at all um, but to go in and answer the questions. He was a, he's a fact witness in a criminal investigation, and um, he certainly, you know, could have refused to do it voluntarily and forced um, the Mueller team to subpoena him to the grand jury, but I have no doubt that they would have taken that step. Um, and, you know, generally, lawyers advising clients would prefer an informal interview setting as opposed to a grand jury setting. Um, when a witness is questioned in the grand jury, um, defense counsel cannot be present in the room. So you have a lot less visibility and control over the dynamics of the questioning and the answering. So I, I think that the idea that this was a big strategic decision is probably um, not quite right. And, um, you know, I think Mr. McGahn, as long, along with other White House officials who presumably have answered questions of, uh, of Mr. Mueller, you know, did so because practically they didn't have a huge amount of choice. Saul Weisenberg, what about that, the argument that he really didn't have much choice? Well, I would say there, there are two points I would make. It's true that you have U.S. versus Nixon, but there's a case from 1997 in the D.C. Circuit, that's the controlling law, in Ray Sealed case. And it's not a cakewalk. Uh, necessarily to overcome executive privilege. Uh, special counsel can't just say, I'm doing, I'm running a grand jury investigation. And there's a real question with Bob Mueller whether he even has the right uh, under his charter to even litigate questions of executive pr privilege. However, if you're the president and the president's team, do you really want to be seen as invoking executive privilege, particularly that early in the investigation when McGahn went in? I think it's, it looks terrible. And so I, I don't completely agree with Catherine. I think the law isn't quite as strong as she suggests. But really, there hasn't been a lot of litigation on it. Well, let's move on just quickly to what we know, uh, uh, Catherine Rumler, of what this investigation amounts to so far. <laughs> from what you've read, from what you know, what do you glean that Robert Mueller has at this point? Well, let me say, I, just based on um, what's publicly available, uh, I don't think that we know really much of anything. Um, I think that the information that has come out of the special counsel's investigation has not come from the investigator, investigators themselves. It's largely come through, you know, witnesses or other people sort of on the periphery of the investigation talking about um, 
you know, questions that they may have answered or trying to surmise what areas um, the special counsel is focused on. And I, I just think we really don't know. We have, we don't have any way of um, giving sort of, you know, credible predictions about where he might ultimately be headed with this investigation. Saul Weisenberg, how do you read what you know so far, what you've seen so far? I think Ms. Rumler's point is, is outstanding. I can guarantee you that 50 to 75 percent of what Mueller is working on, we don't know, and 50 to 75 percent of what you see in the press is wrong. However, on the issue of whether or not there is a criminal conspiracy between people in the Trump campaign and the Russians, we can make educated guesses based on the plea documents that we have seen so far, and none of those plea documents indicate that there is an obstruction case. Uh, but to be continued. Uh, maybe Mueller is keeping that under wraps. But typically, if you have somebody who's pleading, in the plea papers, it's called either a, a statement of facts or a factual basis. I think Mueller calls it statement of the offense. Uh, the person talks about what he or she did. And if you right. look at those, those documents uh, with respect to Papadopoulos, with respect to Flynn, even with respect to Gates, you don't see an obstruction uh, narrative there. So I do think we can make intelligent guesses. 15 seconds. Catherine Rumler, do you see it the same way? Well, I would differ a little bit in saying that. I think that the obstruction facts, to the extent that there are some, and I'm not suggesting that there are, but I think they would post-date those prior plea agreements. So, you know, I'm not sure yeah. how much we can, we can glean from that. Well, we are for sure. We are all keeping our eyes <laughs> on all of it. Catherine Rumler, Saul Weisenberg, we thank you both. Thank you. Thanks, Judy.